I was going through and I was doing the like research for this video where I filled in all of the reasons for or all of the different proof methods that one could or just all the ones that I knew and I was like searching online because I was trying to figure out like did I forget some and I was trying to avoid all of the Latin because a lot of the sources were using all of the Latin like legal argument phrases for why things are true and why arguments are valid blah 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 uh, and I found this PowerPoint um, which is the most unhinged thing I've seen in terms of someone presenting logic in my entire life. And also it's funny because like we're as of recording like a few days from Valentine's day, 2023. So, uh, I just saw this and I could not stop laughing, uh, because I thought it was hilarious and I didn't understand why those slides were there. Why are they there? I have no idea. Uh, but that was just a fun thing that I found while I was just clicking on random resources to just double check to make sure that I didn't just forget to list one of these methods that I use all the time that I didn't want to use the Latin for. So um, that exists in the world, uh, which is fun. Uh, I forget how I got there. Uh, I think it was like it's like hosted on University of Virginia's computer science department website in, a, in some presentations folder or something. But uh, wild, wild. Anyway, back to the content of this video. So I've gone ahead and started with those two example proofs because they give examples of the two different types of proofs that are out there. There are direct proofs, which are much like the first proof that we did. And then there are indirect proofs, much like the second proof that we did. Now, the big caveat here is that I am not at all talking about proof methods. There are several and many of them can come up in both types of proof. And you'll still either have a direct proof or a indirect proof. Some of them are specific to indirect proofs, like things like contradiction are usually come up in indirect proofs and are not usually considered direct arguments. Uh, but some of these other methods that I've listed down here come up in both places. A direct proof is fairly straightforward. It's just you take your initial hypotheses or your initial premises or what you're assuming in the statement and you just push it and you end up with your conclusion or what you wanted to show. Whereas an indirect proof is something that asserts the truth of the conclusion by some logical adjustment or logical reformulation uh, before proceeding with an argument. And that's similar to the second proof that we did, where instead of just working directly with things we knew about the square root of two and trying to show that that number was irrational, we went ahead and added in the additional assumption that let's just say and adjust this statement to be, well, we know things about the square root of two and let's suppose that it is also rational and see if something breaks. Because the things that we knew about square root of two are true already and well, the thing that we're not sure of is if it's rational or not. So if we suppose that it's rational and end up breaking math, then we know that the thing that we added in had to be false and so in that particular case, the negation of the square root of two is rational is the square root of two is not rational or the square root of two is irrational, which then gets you to the conclusion. So direct proofs and indirect proofs can also be broken up into constructive and non-constructive arguments. In a perfect world, we would want all of our proofs to be constructive because constructive arguments tell you exactly how to get to the solution, whether that be in an indirect proof and constructing a counterexample or in a direct proof and giving you an algorithm to how you get your solution. Constructive proofs are really, really nice because they usually can be used to do things in the real world with direct application. So if you give a constructive proof, usually that is in the form of some finite time algorithm that then can be put into a computer and you can have a computer then calculate things for you in some way. Non-constructive proofs on the other hand aren't as nice. They don't have as direct applications because they usually don't tell you how to go about doing something. Sometimes they give you like a good idea of how you might want to approximate 
a solution or an answer to the problem, but they're not always very clear in how you should do that or the tools that they use just prevent finite time algorithms altogether. And so I wanted to go ahead and end this video with a proof of a thing that people use all the time that has more of a constructive flavor to it. And that's the Pythagorean theorem for Euclidean geometry. So that is given A and B are the lengths of the sides of a right triangle with hypotenuse of length C, then in Euclidean geometry, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Now to prove this, to do it constructively, I'm gonna do a geometric construction. So what we do is we go ahead and from some given unit length or some given length one unit, we can go ahead and construct the side or the length A plus B. We can then use that length A plus B to do a geometric construction to build a square with sides of length A plus B. We're gonna go ahead and divide each side but alternate A's and B's. So it'll be A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B as you walk around the outside of the square. Once you've divided the square in this alternating fashion, you can go ahead and connect division points with the division points on adjacent sides. This ends up constructing four right triangles, all of them of the form with sides of length A and B and hypotenuse of length C. This also is pretty nifty because it constructs a square on the inside of these triangles. So the interior region is just C squared. Now, the nice thing about translations is that translating or sliding things in geometric space does not destroy any of the area. So if we stay within the bounding square and we go ahead and slide the triangles according to these arrows, we end up getting two rectangles. The rectangles are going to be AB rectangles and the leftover space within the square are going to be two smaller squares, one of them that has side length A and the other one that has side length B. And because a square's area is just at side length squared, and when we moved the triangles around, we didn't change anything about the underlying area, we get that A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. But yeah, that's basically where I wanted to leave this video. I'll put some exercises up at the end of the video that I'll later on cover in shorts format, uh, just to give you something that if you want to work on stuff or want to try some problems or a few problems related to this stuff or using the ideas that I put in this video, then they're there. Uh, I'll put those up at the end. But uh, as always, my name is Nathan. This one was Chalk. Uh, it's part of this this proof writing thing that I'm doing, series, deal, whatever you call it. Uh, so if you haven't seen the first couple of those videos, I'll put those in the description below. If you have any comments for me about what you would like to see me do with this, you can also put those in the comments below. Anyway, so with that, I just want to say, like, you know, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and you can subscribe for more math stuff. I also talk about my PhD experience and all that stuff on here as well. So you can find those videos on my channel too, if you're interested. Otherwise, as always, I'm Nathan. This one is Chalk and I will see you next time.